we're going to think a bit more about John 11. If you uh, are younger and you've got those sermon sheets and you want to use those, now is a great time to, to write down or to draw things that you remember from the, the story that we heard uh, in the Tyler video or, or from Sharon's reading before uh, or for things that you just hear over the next um, minutes. And of course, one of the things we heard was uh, twice the the line, uh, possibly an accusation, um, certainly directed at Jesus. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. It's hard hitting, isn't it? I don't know if you've ever been uh, accused of something in, in kind of that way, or if you've ever felt responsible uh, in, in that kind of way. If you'd been here, or if you'd done something, this wouldn't have happened, or that wouldn't have happened. And it feels like a huge weight of responsibility on your shoulders, doesn't it, when something like that happens. And yet this has got to be the ultimate. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. That responsibility is on Jesus' shoulders. And yet he doesn't shirk that responsibility. He doesn't try and talk his way out of it. Actually, he accepts that responsibility even more than either Mary or Martha uh, mean when they say it. Because Jesus has something to say at the graveside. Jesus doesn't just stand silently. He has something to say. And that means that Christians have something to say at the graveside. There's an astounding claim in the gospel reading today. Uh, and uh, that is that if the claim is true, it changes everything. It's the claim that uh, Christianity, Christians uniquely, have an answer to death. Have something to say in the face of death. And if true, it changes everything, doesn't it? Now, don't uh, hear me wrong. It's not a boast. Christians don't have an answer to death because we're better than other people. Uh, we're not. Or because we have more brain power than other people. We don't. Or because uh, we uh, are more smug than other people, which, well, sometimes Christians can be, can't we? But we shouldn't be, and we're sorry for that. But it's none of those things. It's just in the name. Christian means follower of Christ. If you're a Christian, you've realized that you're not better than anyone else. Uh, you've realized that you need safe saving. You've realized that you need uh, someone to reach into the mess of our lives and rescue us. You need Jesus. And if you're a Christian today, you have the Good Shepherd that we talked about three weeks ago. You are a branch on that true vine that we talked about uh, two weeks ago that's Jesus. You've come to Jesus and eaten the bread of life. Uh, here's the sandwich that we made uh, last week. The bread of life that sustains us. If you wouldn't call yourself a Christian this morning, then, then all those things are open to you. They're offered to us all through him. If you missed those talks, you can catch up with them on our, our YouTube channel. You can track through that thinking of the I am statements. Because God wants to speak to all of us through this series. And where, wherever you are in your faith, in your life, uh, come and ask questions. We had a great uh, few conversations after church last week um, outside with some great questions that covered uh, predestination, prayer, uh, if Jesus is the way, what about people before Jesus? Great to talk about these things and to think about them and, and to, to go away turning what we hear in church over in our minds and, and chatting with other people about them. And as we spend these weeks focusing on Jesus and those I am statements, they describe him, don't they? He describes himself. And it's Jesus that has something to say in the face of death today. In fact, here's what he said at the graveside of his friend. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. At a time when most of us fall silent or stumble over words in the face of death, Jesus makes this audacious claim to be the resurrection and the life. So we need to, we need to check it out, don't we? If we're a, a, a Christian, we need to know that Jesus makes that claim and that us through uh, him have something unique to say in the face of death. Because those words are often used in a funeral service. 
often at the, the start. They're one of the scriptures that are often read out in C of E funeral services. But it's possible for them to sound so empty, isn't it? I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though they die. Whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And yet at the funeral we're faced with death. But we know that Jesus doesn't say things flippantly or, or mistakenly. So we've got to get to the heart of what he means when he says those things. And so we're going to rewind to the start of this chapter, uh, John 11 verse 1. Uh, and it's a great start to the chapter because as we heard in the, the story that was in the Tyler video, uh, it starts with, now a man named Lazarus was ill. In the chapter just before that, which we thought about three weeks ago, uh, Jesus says he's the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. And he says, I lay down my life so that I can take it back up again. And we think that's a bold claim. That's already a claim to have some sort of power over life and death, isn't it? I lay down my life so that I can take it back up again. And then in chapter 11, uh, the start comes along and there's a guy called Lazarus who is ill. And we think this is a time for Jesus to prove his claim. Lazarus uh, uh, is, is ill and he's getting ill and things don't look good. And we watch to see how it pans out. And sure enough, the message gets sent to Jesus. Lazarus is, is Mary and Martha's brother. That's Mary and Martha of the At Home with Mary and Martha uh, Bible passage fame. Uh, when Jesus unexpectedly drops into Martha's house with his disciples and, and hangers on and Martha has to cater for everyone and uh, Mary sits at Jesus' feet. And now Jesus is close to this family. They're friends, he loves them and the message reaches him, Lord, the one you love is ill. So we've gone from a man called Lazarus is ill to uh, the one that Jesus loves is ill. Now that's not abnormal, is it? Loving, Jesus is, loving people is one of Jesus' big things, isn't it? But it's important because we're about to see his love in action. We're about to see his love in action. Uh, and did you spot it? This love in action. Jesus' heartfelt response to, to hearing someone he loves is ill. Uh, if you missed it, here it is, John uh, 11, uh, chapter 5. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And so when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed where he was for two more days. The disciples must have been like, Jesus, what can we do to help? You should go and be with him straight away. You should go and be with the family. We can pick you up some uh, soup and grapes on the way to take to his bedside. Peter would have been looking for his phone so Jesus could FaceTime Lazarus and show that he cared. But Jesus says, I've got a few more things to do here. And then after a couple of days, how about we make the trip to Judea to see them? How do we reconcile those two sentences? Jesus loved Mary, Martha and Lazarus. So when he heard he was ill, he stayed where he was. Well, the key is in verse 4. Uh, if you've got a Bible there, have a look uh, with me at verse 4. When he heard this, when Jesus got the message about Lazarus being ill, Jesus said... Verse 4, this illness will not end in death. No, it's for God's glory that God's Son may be glorified through it. We've got to dig down into that. Jesus is saying he knows how the illness will end. And that through it, God's Son will be glorified. Now, Bethany was, was about four days' journey away from where Jesus was. So uh, maybe he knew waiting a couple of days wasn't going to make much difference in the scheme of things. We don't know. But putting all that we've just seen together, could it be? Could it be that Jesus was delaying going to be with Lazarus because he loved them and wanted them to see God's glory being revealed, God's love in action? Which means them understanding, them grasping something of God's glory, doesn't it? And seeing who Jesus uh, is. Maybe more important than comforting Lazarus in his illness. And so they make the journey. Uh, and uh, of course the plot twists. Verse 17 where we started, where Sharon started our reading. Uh, on his arrival Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. They think it's all over. And yet, uh, Jesus has something to say in the face of death. I am the resurrection and the life. Not just don't worry, there's a heaven. 
and you'll see Lazarus again. That's a huge comfort though, isn't it? That's an amazing promise. But Jesus goes further. Not just there will be a resurrection, but I am the resurrection and the life. Not just there is a heaven, but I am the way, the truth and the life. We'll hear next week. Not just there's a heaven and, and you know, I'll point the way you go and find, out, uh, find it. And, and uh, you know, hopefully when you get there, all will be well. I, I'm with you and I am the resurrection and the life. And then he lays the challenge to Martha. Do you believe this? It's great to have this uh, window, another window into Mary and Martha and their characters. Remember, they're, they're not parables, they're people. Um, we said that when we looked at the, the, um, uh, the account of Jesus coming to their house, when it seems a bit like it's set up like a parable, but actually they're people. So we have to uh, think about this as their character. I think they're great examples of two types of people, aren't they? Mar Martha is word perfect in her answers. She has the right answers and she's well thought out. Lord, she says, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. And when Jesus says, your brother will rise again, Martha has the answer. I know he will rise again on the resurrection in the last day. When Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life, do you believe this? Martha has the answer. Yes, Lord, I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. When Mary hears Jesus is there, she runs to him and falls at his feet. She says the same first words as Martha, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. They're both real, both genuine, both different. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And then she weeps at Jesus' feet. I think we have a bit of both of those reactions uh, in us in the face of death. We know, as Christians, if you're a Christian, we know what the answers should be. We want to preach them to ourselves, don't we? But at times... When it hits us, we just crumple. And when we crumple, we crumple at Jesus' feet. And we weep with him. And of course, it's so important, that shortest verse in the Bible, isn't it? Those two words, Jesus wept. It's so important to know that Jesus weeps with us. It's so important to know that Jesus weeps at death and sadness and sickness and sorrow. It's so important for us to know that he knows that he gets what we're going through. It's so important to know all of that. And yet it's also so important to know that this reading doesn't end there. Weeping with someone, comforting someone, coming alongside someone in their grief is essential, isn't it? But we also have more to say about death because Jesus has more to say about death. And so not for the last time in this gospel, he commands the gravestone to be rolled away. And Jesus, the Lord God on earth, the resurrection and the life, commands Lazarus' lifeless body out of the grave. And those words have power and Lazarus is raised to life. A few weeks ago in uh, the talk, I said, if you're thinking there might be more out there, more to life. If you're not sure about Christianity, about what it really is about Jesus, then keep listening to this series. Keep coming along. Well, here is the heart of the gospel, isn't it? Laid out. Jesus offers us life. In Jesus, there's light and life and love. That's where it all started. If we want a, a gospel summary, in the, in the beginning, there was light and life and love. The Father loving the Son in the joy of the Holy Spirit. And that's where everything comes from. But we look around and the world doesn't uh, always, doesn't often seem like that, does it? We see darkness and death and a disconnection from God. Because when you turn from God, you turn from those things. You turn from light, you go to darkness. You turn from love, you go to disconnection. You turn from life, you go to death. But what does Jesus do when he sees the world turning from God? He comes after us. Just like the shepherd seeking the lost sheep, Jesus comes after us. He says, your darkness will be my darkness. I'll be with you. Your disconnection will be my disconnection. Your death 
will be my death in your place. And he dies and plunges that darkness and disconnection and death into the depths. And then just like Lazarus, another stone is rolled away. And he rises to new life. Which he then offers to us. You in the darkness, do you want my light? I am the light, Jesus said. You in disconnection from God. Do you want to be a part with me? I am the true vine. You in death. Do you want my life? I am the resurrection and the life. All of these images, all of these promises are centered on him, are centered on knowing Jesus and saying yes to him. And they're offered freely, without conditions to everyone, to me, to you. And at the end of the talk last week, we prayed... A prayer, if you prayed that prayer, that's saying yes to him. Maybe you did, in which case you are part of that light, life and love. Whether that's you or not, let me uh, invite you to pray now, to, to think about all of these things. To think about that offer that Jesus is, is holding out to us. Not just all the benefits that come with him, as we said last week. Not just the things you can get out of attending church or, or being part of a church, as we thought about last week. But the offer is him, a relationship with him, a hope in life and a hope, a true hope in death. As we reflect on those things, uh, the musicians and singers are going are to come up and we're going to hear these words of truth sung for us. And as we do, I, uh, I invite you to use them as a prayer, use them as a time uh, to reflect, to think about uh, the truth of these words. What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone, Christ alone. What is our only confidence that our souls to him belong? Who holds our faith when fears arise? Who stands above the stormy trial? Who sends the waves that bring us nigh unto the shore? The rock of Christ.